Larry O'Brien was with the president the morning of November 22, 1963. There was, as I recall it, a breakfast meeting to take place and an outdoor event ever across from the hotel in a big open area. And I went in to visit the president and he was looking out the window down at this open area where they were putting the finishing touches on the platform and all the rest of it. And he made the comment to me, they talk about security and protecting you. But he said, look at this. If somebody wants to get you, they can always do it. I rode in the car behind the president. I rode in the car with the Secret Service. And now they had come on the cars. We're just about to make the turn and I had always been conscious of the president's time, and I'm riding with Ken O'Donnell, who was the appointment secretary. And I looked at my watch and I said, Kenny, how far away are we from the trademark where he was due to speak at 12.30? And Kenny said, it's only about five minutes away. And I'm looking at my watch and I said, uh, that's great. Will only be a few minutes late. Suddenly, shots were fired. And my initial reaction was uh, to say to the driver, What was that? And he said, I don't know, perhaps it's a 21 gun salute. But the motorcade started to move out rapidly. You could see the president's car and Clint Hill grasping the, the rear trunk and off we went and of course I have no idea whether the president or anyone has been harmed but you have a at least a feeling that indeed shots had been fired Clint Hill myself and another agent lifted the president uh, on the stretcher and with Jackie running beside us, we raced into the trauma room at the, at the hospital. When we crowded into the hospital, Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly were standing there. John Connolly's wife, the governor of Texas, who was in the car with the president. And uh, it was uh, understood that she was going to an upper floor of the hospital, which I construed to mean that John Connolly had been hit. However, that was true, but uh, I didn't recognize why Jack Kennedy wasn't being moved to the operating level of the hospital prayed expecting the worst but hoping for the best and then at one o'clock Texas time he was pronounced dead meanwhile no one has uh, any idea of the circumstances no one can be sure that the vice president is the target and their objective was to move the body of the president to the airport and back home. And that objective was being stymied, or attempts were being made to stymie it, by, I believe, a coroner and others, some local officials. And it became somewhat of a scene. Finally, we pushed aside the local officials, literally, advised them we were moving the body out, which we did, and with Jackie, those of us directly involved, we uh, moved to a remote corner of Love Field, and we tried over the 
this long flight of stairs, the Secret Service and others, moves the casket out of the plane, strap it in, and that process. One of the handles of the casket was broken, I guess, but it wasn't an easy thing to do. And then uh, Jackie, Ken O'Donnell, Dave Powers, and I sat opposite the casket. The plane was not taking off, and we made inquiry. The delay was the president's desire, the new president's desire, to have a Texas judge who was en route to the airport swear him in. And now came that long ride back. We sat with Jackie. And she talked about how how much he loved the trip to Ireland and how she wished she could have gone and she was telling him that she would have these cadets to perform for the president in Ireland perform at the at the funeral and and, and I was so proud of her that that uh, she was holding us together. And I remember at one time she said, what will you do now, Dave? You were with him for all these years. And, and uh, I never felt so bad about anything in all, in all my life. Just about the time we started making that turn, uh, Ruby stepped out from behind a man over here. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught him as he, as he started down that last step just before he shot. And with Oswald died the answers to questions that are still being asked now a quarter of a century later. Questions of who, questions of why. Tony Clark, CNN, Dallas. As Tony mentioned, there are many theories about what may have happened that day in Dallas 25 years ago. Later tonight, on Larry King Live, immediately following Prime News, some of those theories will be explored with guests David Scheim and David Bellum, authors of books about the assassination. This nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. After that march, President Kennedy invited us to the White House to meet with him again that same day, August the 28th, and he, he was smiling. Uh, he thanked us all, and we had a glass of orange juice with him, and uh, he said, you did a great job. It was so impressive. The test, I think, of John Kennedy and civil rights is that when he moved, I think he moved at the right time. Uh, Kennedy did, when the time came, meet the popular protest with the response that the civil rights movement had needed. It is clear by the fall of 1963 that the tide is turning. The nuclear test ban treaty, the introduction of the civil rights bill, the growing popularity of the Peace Corps, the spectacular success of the space program. The president has even told aides privately that he will pull U.S. forces out of Vietnam after the 1964 election. For now, however, he continues to send more soldiers, despite warnings that they will fall into political and military quicksand. But the administration can point with pride to its major achievements. And Kennedy can start to think about re-election next year. When we left for Texas, he was looking forward to the 1964 campaign, that he felt he was going to win big. So he was eager. Texas was one of those states he was after. The Kennedy's arrival in Dallas on Friday, November 22nd, is carried live on local television. Hundreds of people turn out at the Dallas airport to get a brief look at the President and First Lady. There's Mrs. Kennedy, and the crowd yells, and the President of the United States. And I can see his suntan all the way from here. Secret Service right along with the President, of course. 
president passes right in front of a Dallas police officer, right in front of our cameras now. Somebody patted his shoulder. Mrs. Kennedy coming along behind him, grinning all the while. The president saying, thank you very much. If I may be permitted to, to read a presidential lip movement. Mrs. Kennedy stepping in the car first. Now the president. They both in the back seat now. The president and first lady. That motorcade will swing way around, go by the Continental uh, Airlines maintenance hangar, head out for downtown Dallas where thousands should already be on the street right now, uh, waiting for a view of the president and his wife. Also waiting is a man with a mail order rifle. I rode in the Secret Service car right behind them and uh, I was in the jump seat in line with the president and John Conley and the crowds were tremendous. Jim Wright as a congressman from nearby Fort Worth is uncertain how his neighbors in Dallas will react to JFK. I just thought well this is you know, this is an occasion when people really need to turn out for the president of the United States. This is, there isn't one and uh, they did. Coming down from that short flight from Fort Worth to Dallas, I'm talking to the President Jackie in the back of the plane, uh, and I said, Mr. President, you wave to the Texans on the right, and Jackie will wave to the ones on the left. And this is exactly what's happening when the first shot was fired. My first instinctive thought was, somebody is uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, fire a 21-gun salute with a rifle. Uh, and I thought that would sort of inappropriate. They could have done better than that if they were going to fire a salute. I had heard the noise. I'm looking at the president at the same time, and he, he had pulled his hand uh, toward his throat, and he fell over toward Jackie. There's a second shot, and, and now Governor Conley is out of sight. The first two sort of came close together, but now we're riding and praying. And now we see the shot that hit the president in the head. In the agonizing seconds that follow, Jacqueline Kennedy climbs over the back seat of the car. A Secret Service agent jumps on the car and holds her down as it speeds away. Within minutes, the limousine arrives at Parkland Hospital, where the president is taken to emergency surgery. And then it's just a race, one doctor after another, and it was a tiny room, and I had a chair for Jackie outside of it, and every now and then she'd go in, and, and you know, some doctor or a nurse would take her out because there wasn't any room there. As surgeons work desperately, Dallas station WFAA-TV interrupts his regular programming. Find a zipper hidden in the uh, arm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You'll excuse the fact that I'm out of breath, but about 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Let me quote to you this. And I'll, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. Program director Jay Watson and announcer Jerry Haynes saw the motorcade turn the corner just before the shootings. Camera shots. They grabbed the first eyewitnesses they could find and rushed them to WFAA studios several blocks away. May I have your name, please, sir? Bill Newman. And this is Mrs. Newman? Yes, sir. And this is? James Clayton. James, and this is? Billy. Billy, tell me what you saw and what you felt. What happened to you? We were, we'd just come from Love Field after seeing the president and the first lady. And we were just in front of the triple underpass on Elm Street. And we were at the edge of the curve, getting ready to wave at the president. We thought someone had thrown uh, firecrackers or something against the uh, president's car, and it just looked like a bad joke. 
uh, of course, as the motorcade came closer to us, we could uh, see that it was not a joke. Uh, I remember the president throwing his hands up as if I thought to uh, shield his face from something, uh, debris or something from the firecrackers, uh, which in reality, it was a reaction to the gunshot uh, that had hit him. I walked over and looked over the banister there and saw across the street that you were down on the ground uh, so that uh, to keep out of the line of fire. What was the first thought that struck your mind? Oh, I, I thought it was a firecracker, and I saw the blood, and I I had the baby, and I, I just ran, and we I got on top of him and laid on the grass. I heard her scream, oh, my God, they've shot Jack. And, you know, at that time, we everything sort of happened so fast we got down. I was terrified that, you know, we were going to be shot or my children were going to be hurt. Reporters resident rushed to the hospital. The first reports from Parkland are broadcast within minutes. Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth said both Kennedy and Connolly were seriously wounded but still alive. A call has been sent out from some of the top surgical specialists in Dallas and a call also went out for a priest. Maybe about 15 minutes later, a priest arrived, and, and uh, when he went in to give the president the last rites of the church, Jackie went in again, and, and it was such a uh, sad day. I had viewed him with Mrs. Kennedy. It was a half hour before we authorized an announcement to the press and the world that he was dead because we just couldn't cope with it. We were, there was still disbelief. We have this from Washington. Government sources now confirm that President Kennedy is dead. So that apparently is the final word and an incredible event that I am sure no one except the assassin himself could have possibly imagined would occur on this day. Now, everything else just stops. The nation is paralyzed by the news. The nation's capital has learned of the president's death in stunned disbelief. Outside ABC studios, the sidewalk has been jammed with crowds following developments with shock and bewilderment on loudspeakers and TV screens. One can see the tragic news spreading from mouth to mouth on the streets. Here and there, people are crying and there are reactions of rage and fury. At the White House, some of the staff was on hand as usual, though some were with the president. Crowds gathered here too and saw the lowering of the White House flag to half-mast when the death of the president was confirmed. Moments after the gunfire, Dallas police converge on the Texas School Book Depository. Witnesses report seeing a man in a sixth floor window holding what looked like a gun. Inside, police find a high-powered rifle equipped with a scope. And next to a sixth-floor window, empty rifle shells. One of the men who works in the building cannot be accounted for. His name is Lee Harvey Oswald. You may report this bulletin that a Secret Service agent and a Dallas policeman were shot and killed here today. They were shot some distance from the area where President Kennedy was assassinated. No other information immediately available from there. Police rush to the Oak Cliff section of Dallas where patrolman J.D. Tippett has been murdered. No Secret Service agent has been hurt. And now comes a call from a nearby movie house that an armed man has taken refuge in the theater. While broadcasters wait for this story to develop, they continue to talk with eyewitnesses to the assassination. A gentleman just walked in our studio that I am meeting for the first time as well as you. This is WFA-TV in Dallas, Texas. May I have your name, please, sir? My name is Abraham Zapruda. Mr. Zapruda? Zapruda, yes, sir. Zapruda. And would you tell us your story, please, sir? I got out in, uh, about a half hour earlier and get into a good spot to shoot some pictures. And I found a spot, one of these uh, concrete blocks that I have down near that park near the underpass. And I got on top there, there was another girl from my office, she was right behind me. And as I was shooting, as the president was coming down from Houston Street making his turn, it was about halfway down there, I had a shot. And he slumped to the side, like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say it was one or two. FBI agents take possession of Zapruder's film before he does this interview. They do not want it shown to the public before they study it in detail. At Parkland Hospital, Jacqueline Kennedy watches 
as the casket with her husband's body is placed in a waiting hearse. We left the hospital and we uh, carried the casket on Air Force One, you know, sort of forcing it in. They made a section of the back by removing some seats. There is one last official act to take care of, and it happens only two hours after John F. Kennedy was mortally wounded. In the cramped surroundings of the president's plane, the torch is passed. I've just received word that Lyndon Johnson has been sworn in as president of the United States. More background material on that in just a few moments from New York. I'll repeat, Lyndon Johnson is now president of the United States. He was sworn in. Moments later, Air Force One climbs into the Texas sky for John F. Kennedy's final trip home. Yes, there were scores of them, were there not? Yes, running in the direction of the grassy knoll, that's correct. Also in the direction of the, the assassination center.